Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Good afternoon, and welcome to the symposium, The Unknown History of Science in America at the Franklin Institute. I'm Dennis Went, President and CEO. It's a great op uh, honor for us to be here to join with uh, Penn and Dr. Ruth Cowan, who has been the organizer of this, uh, of this symposium. I also want to thank the Barra Foundation and the Unisys Corporation because of the funding that they have provided in order to do this project. Now, some of you, other than the Institute folks who are here, probably know the Franklin Institute as a science museum. How many of you saw Body Worlds? How many wanted to see it but were too frightened? <laughs> 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 There's a certain queasiness about the exhibit, but I must say that it was by far the most successful exhibition we've ever had. We had 603,000 people in a little over six months. It is the largest exhibition in the history of Philadelphia. But that's only part of what we do. In addition to the museum, we're also an institution of uh, program development, which is chaired by uh, our innovation center, chaired by Dr. Um, Carol Parsonen, who is uh, with us, and also the Franklin Center, which is responsible for giving the awards that we have done since, 100, since 1824. The greatest men and women of science have come to the Franklin Institute during that period of time. And what we have as a part of our archives are 3,800 case files, which include drawings, patents, uh, correspondence, <coughs> notes, um, even hand-drawn uh, uh, sketches, such as by Thomas Edison, um, that have been presented in order to what they, we refer to as prosecute this case. What has occurred is a, a selection of case files between 1824 and 1954 have been selected for an online presentation. And that's what you're going to hear about because we have 130 years of history, particularly of the history of science, of really primary sources. These are the men and women who have been responsible for the advances. Two areas have been selected, energy and communication. There have been a total of 16 cases that are being developed online, and we ask you or urge you to go to fi.edu backslash um, explore, where you'll see case studies with uh, Marie Curie, Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, Eureka, Eureka uh, Fermi. Um, it's just some of the examples of the people who have come to the Institute to receive awards and who are part of this uh, case file presentation. So with that, thank you all for coming to join us. Uh, Dr. Collin, we'll turn it over to you, and we hope that you'll come and visit the Institute on a great number of new programs that we're going to be doing. Um, this fall will be a major exhibition on Einstein. Uh, next year uh, will be King Tut, and in 2009, I'm sorry, next fall is Darwin, then is King Tut, and then 2009 is Einstein. So there's a lot of good science going on at the Institute. So thank you all very much. Thanks. I'm Ruth Schwartz Cowan. I'm the chair of the Department of the History and Sociology of Science here at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm delighted to be co-sponsoring this symposium, or we're delighted to be co-sponsoring this symposium uh, with the Franklin Institute. In History and Sociology of Science, we do um, undergraduate and graduate training in the histories of science, technology, and medicine. Despite our title, we just can't put all of that into the title. Um, and we are one of the nation's uh, most important departments for the production of new faculty in those fields and also for the production of research in those fields. 
And the case files that we're going to talk about today are the kinds of primary sources, that's a technical term that we use in our field, for research, particularly in the history of science and technology. Indeed, um, I do want to say something publicly that I have said privately to the staff at the Franklin Institute, which is that Franklin himself understood himself as both a scientist and a technologist. And um, th these materials that we're going to talk about today are important in the history of science, but they're even more important in the history of technology, which is actually quite different from the history of science. In any event, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker, today's speakers, and also when they have finished making their presentations to moderate the discussion that will follow. So I'm going to introduce them in all together now uh, in the order in which they will speak. Our first speaker uh, will be Peter Collings, who is the Morris L. Clothier, I hope I pronounced that correctly, the Morris L. Clothier Professor of Physics at our neighboring institution, Swarthmore College. He is um, a member of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, a specialist in the field of liquid crystals, the author of a um, trade book on the subject called Liquid Crystals, Nature's Delicate Phase of Matter, uh, published in 1999, the second edition of which was published in 1999 by Princeton University Press. He is also the chair of the Franklin Institute's Committee on Science and the Arts. Um, and I will, as an historian of technology, remind us all that when that committee was named, the arts meant the work of artisans, not the work of pictorial representationists and humanists and musicians. Um, that committee, the Committee on Science and the Arts, does the research that lies behind the awarding of these medals that we're going to hear about today. The second speaker uh, will be Karen Ilinich, who is the Director of Educational Technology Programs for the Franklin Institute. Uh, Ms. Ilinich holds a master's degree in educational technology, and she's currently pursuing a doctorate in the same field through the Pepperdine University's Graduate School of Education and Psychology. Uh, Ms. Ilinich was responsible for the planning and the work that brought these materials online and the concepts that helped the Institute to understand how the case files could be used to support K through 12 education. We think of them in our department as supporting undergraduate and graduate education. Uh, she has worked on making them useful to K-12 educators. Our final speaker will be uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Nathan Ensmanger, who is assistant professor of the History and Sociology of Science at Penn. Dr. Ensmanger has a bachelor's degree in engineering, and he is our in-house specialist on computer technology. He gives courses for undergraduates on the history of technology, on the history of computing, on the implications of computing and other communication technologies for the social life of our country and the world. And he's going to, oh, I should also say that uh, Nathan is the undergraduate director for one of the two majors that we run out of our department, uh, the major we call science technology and society. Uh, he's finishing a manuscript, uh, the title of which is The Computer Boys, Technology and Organizational Politics in the Computer Age. And he will be speaking to us today in part about the essay that he wrote for the unknown history of science in America on communications. Dr. Collins. 
Thank you, Ruth, and welcome this afternoon. What I'd like to do is give you a little history of the Franklin Institute and the Committee on Science and the Arts and tell you a little bit about how it goes and does its business. Hopefully when I'm done, you'll have a good appreciation of what you might find in these case files as the speakers continue and show you uh, some of the actual material. Um, the Franklin Institute, uh, the story of the Franklin Institute begins with Samuel Vaughan Merrick, uh, a young man who uh, was placed in charge of a fire engine construction company, knowing nothing at all about the construction of fire engines. He sought help from the University of Pennsylvania, only to find out that the studies there were much too theoretical. And he tried to uh, join forces with some of the, um, the artisan groups, but because of a lack of background in the area, was not given any help at all. He met up with William Keating, a professor at the, the University of Pennsylvania, professor of mineral mineralogy and chemistry. And uh, Keating w had noticed that tech tec technological institutes were starting in many cities and he wished Philadelphia to have an institute where people from all walks of life could uh, learn a wide range of science and technology. So the two of them joined forces, gathered support among the leaders of Philadelphia, and in 1824 formed the Franklin Institute. The mission included instruction in science and technology, uh, a museum, a library, the uh, examination and reporting on inventions, including the awarding of prizes uh, deemed uh, exceptional, and a workshop slash research laboratory. One year later, in order to pursue the charge of uh, examining and reporting on inventions, a committee was formed called the Board of Examiners. Shortly after, its name was changed to the Committee on Inventions, and in 1834, it became the Committee on Science and the Arts. Its role was to examine and report on new inventions. That includes the awarding of prizes for exceptional work, maintain an experimental workshop and laboratory, and to oversee the publication of a journal, the Journal of the Franklin Institute. Um, its first actual medal was awarded in 1875. And in 1893, with the growth of science and technology into such a broad field, and the feeling that there was no way one could, committee could stay on top of it all, it decided to concentrate on the recognition of exceptional work rather than research um, across the areas of science and engineering. This was made possible because of a donation by Henry Bartol, donation to the Franklin Institute that allowed a institute within the Franklin Institute to be uh, started that could carry on some research. This became the Bartol Institute of the Franklin Institute. It uh, specialized in electricity and nuclear physics. Um, over the years it moved to Swarthmore College and finally now is at the University of Delaware. The medals were made possible by donations and up until the very end of the 20th century, the medals had the names of the donors, or in some cases, a name that was stipulated by the donors. So as you look through the case file, files, you will see that many, many different medals are being considered uh, from case to case. And here is a list of them. Um, some of these had significant endowments and were given many times. Some of them were given very few times with uh, long stretches in between, depending on the nature of the endowment. So names like this will be associated with uh, the case files. Because of the difference in endowments and the ability to give these medals, it was decided uh, around 2000 to combine all the endowments into something that would have stability and could be used year after year after year. And so what was done was the creation from this combined endowment of uh, six medals, all called Benjamin Franklin medals, but in separate areas. Chemistry, 
computer and cognitive science, engineering, usually mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, earth and environmental science, life science, and physics. So those will be the awards you will see in more recent case files, which will not be uh, made public for quite some time. The Committee on Science and the Arts itself uh, is a group of volunteers. Uh, by statutes, there can be no more than 75 members. The members serve three-year terms and are appointed uh, by the president of the Franklin Institute. They represent quite a diverse range of employment from academia, industry, consulting firms, government, small businesses, quite a few. And within the committee, each member belongs to one cluster. And if you look at the list of clusters on the screen, you'll see that they are parallel to the Benjamin Franklin Awards. And so it is the job of the cluster to do the research, discussion, and uh, preparation work for each of the Benjamin Franklin Awards uh, that I showed before. For the case files to make sense to you, you should know something about the procedures used by the Committee on Science and the Art. Each cluster is constantly receiving nominations for medalists and also is generating its own nominations. Possible medalists from these nominations are researched and discussed by the cluster. At some point, uh, for a much smaller number of possible medalists, outside letters are requested. Um, and the writers of these letters are asked to speak about the appropriateness of a medal uh, for the person under consideration. Each year, the cluster chooses one case over all the others. Um, so armed with the research it has done, the discussion, and the external letters, one case is chosen. A subcommittee is formed, usually of two or three members of the uh, Science and Arts Committee. So in the files, you will see documents prepared by the subcommittee for each case. And the subcommittee starts to prosecute the case. That begins with a case report that is first vetted within the cluster. And finally, one subcommittee member, the sponsor, appears before the entire Committee on Science and the Arts and reads the case report. There must be two readings. The first introduces the committee to the case uh, and discussion follows. And then a second reading after members have uh, done more research or even the subcommittee has done more work. Um, those are lively discussions. Um, hard questions are asked of every sponsor during these case reports. If approved after the second reading, the recommendation of the Committee on Science and of the Arts sends, uh, goes to the Board of Trustees of the Franklin Institute, and if they approve uh, the medal, it is awarded as a Benjamin Franklin Medal um, the following spring. So I hope now you know exactly how these case, uh, case reports that you're look, going to look at came into being. Thank you. The particular perspective that I'd like to offer today is the nature of science and K-12 education and how the Franklin Institute's collection of historical case files can be made useful for learning at the K-12 level. In 1996, the National Science Education Standards made a very clear call for students to learn about the nature of science. A decade later, I believe this goal remains largely unmet, and it's primarily because teachers themselves have not been given appropriate opportunity to learn about the nature of science before they approach it with their students. All too often in the programs we do at the Franklin Institute, we encounter teachers who are still developing their understanding of what it means to be and to do, to be a scientist and to do science. 
The idea that I'd like to work with today derives from Bruno Latour's work that suggests that scientists act as members of social networks that provide the infrastructure and opportunity for innovation. If we think about science in those terms, it's clear that teachers are key primary actors already in the network of science. The challenge is to help them understand that identity and to embrace it fully and bring their students into the same perspective. The Franklin Institute's case files are clearly and ideally positioned to help counter a rising trend of student disinterest in science at the K-12 level, particularly at the middle school and early high school stages. The science is of a very vibrant experience. The development of technology is a very exciting process, yet students learn science in, and technology in very secondary, isolated ways. This contradicts the reality of what a life in science and technology means. And the case files can help by bringing stories of what it means to be a scientist and what it means to do technology across generations. The case files are filled with real stories of real people, and there is an inherent drama of human achievement. The, it's unfiltered, it's very human, it's very real, it's a little messy, and I'd like to show you some examples of what I mean. First of all, I'll just tell you a little story. This is a little snippet captured from some of the case files that my team and I have been working with in the past year. In 1897, the Franklin Institute awarded a Crescent Medal to C. Francis Jenkins for the, the development of a technology known as the Fantascope. It was a very early motion picture technology. In 1913, the Franklin Institute recognized Jenkins again, this time for his development of the motion picture apparatus. In 1924, Thomas Edison wrote a letter to the Franklin Institute. In the letter, he questioned the award, the medal that was given to Jenkins in 1897. So, you know, 25 years plus have passed, and Edison claims that he was never made aware of the fact that Jenkins was receiving the awards that he received earlier. And so Edison is challenging Jenkins' right to have received those awards. The Franklin Institute, and I should say that this, this correspondence is exceptionally well documented in the case files. Exceptionally well documented. Every piece of paper is preserved. Every letter is acknowledged with a letter. Uh, many letters merely say, thank you for your letter. And it, um, it is a very thick file that documents this correspondence and exchange. The next step was that the Franklin Institute wrote a letter to C. Francis Jenkins asking him if Edison could have permission to see the case file from 1897. That, of course, is, is counter to the procedures that the, case, the Committee on Science and the Arts follows in its prosecution of cases. So the only way that Edison would have been able to get permission to see those case files would have been with Jenkins' permission. Uh, Jenkins denied Edison's request. A few months later, the lawyers began <laughs> to enter the conversation. It's at this point in, in October of 25 that the first letter comes from the law firm of Dyer, who is a patent attorney. And essentially, he begins a process of challenging Jenkins' earlier awards. Ultimately, the Franklin Institute takes its position on this matter based upon a Supreme Court ruling. Earlier, the uh, challenge to Jenkins' rights to uh, the profits from the Fantascope and motion picture apparatus was a case that made its way to the Supreme Court. And the Franklin Institute basically follows that ruling in its own decision as to whether or not to pursue this. A, a couple of years later, in 1927, Dyer writes his last letter to the Franklin Institute. It's sort of a last gasp letter. Uh, and eventually the case dies. 
what this story, which is completely available to you online if you're interested in reading the details of it, but what this story illustrates is the peer review process and the fact that provenance in science and technology in particular is not always clear. The, today, the peer review process happens much more quickly because of communications technologies, obviously. Uh, but a century ago, it was possible for 20 years to pass without one scientist, one technologist in this case, having been made aware of accomplishments that another one had received. This is the nature of science that we want to show students. This is the nature of science that we want teachers to begin to understand, that it's not always a clear-cut process with clear-cut decisions. This is Nikola Tesla. He was an imaginative, visionary genius, truly. If you, if you follow the story of Tesla, I think you'll agree. Uh, truly imaginative genius. He died penniless. How? Why? A fascinating life story. Um, one example that, that Tesla, Tesla gave himself was that he considered himself a pure scientist. And he definitely differentiated himself from the technologists of the world, from the applied scientists of the world. And the example he gave was that uh, a, a, an applied scientist, when faced with the challenge of finding a needle in a haystack, an applied scientist would methodically begin a process of examining each and every piece of hay looking for the needle. Whereas a pure scientist like Tesla himself, he would simply go and sit and think about the nature and the concept of a needle and about what hay is and how it works. So he really did see himself very much as separate from applied scientists. He was a pure scientist and that, that idealism and that unending commitment to that pure pursuit of knowledge um, did factor into his ultimate fate. Thomas Alva Edison, on the other hand, a compatriot of Tesla's. He socialized with presidents and captains of industry as a wealthy man. The difference between the pure scientist of Tesla and the applied scientist of Edison is a fabulous case study for teachers and for students to begin to perceive the fact that technology is a very, that science and technology is a very broad field with different roles available for different people to play. Following Edison's death, on October 18, 1931, President Hoover issued a statement requesting that all Americans across the country turn off their lights for one minute at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time as a tribute to the passing of Edison. Significantly different than the penniless death of, of Tesla, yet their contributions to science and technology are quite equal in importance. Perhaps Edison's most important invention, however, was the development of the modern research laboratory. The concept of the modern research laboratory continues today. The way we think of bringing science and technologists together to work on, in pursuit of new ideas and new technologies really derives from Edison's workshop. In 1916, specifically May 15th, it was medal day at the Franklin Institute, and a man named Keller was asked to make introductory remarks for John J. Carty. And in those introductory remarks, he said this, in the discussions on the teaching of science in our schools and colleges, there is often a tendency on the part of educators to underestimate and even to belittle the value of applied science. Only a few weeks ago, I listened to an entertaining and in some respects quite illuminating after dinner speech in which the applications of scientific knowledge were referred to as ephemeral, while the speaker, an eminent biologist, laid great stress upon the permanent value of the results of scientific investigation. Such statements, Mr. President, are apt to lead to conclusions which are quite erroneous and certainly at variance with the traditions and the beliefs of this venerable institute devoted to science and the mechanic arts. I think the fact that we're hearing statements like this in 1916 
is important for teachers to hear, important for students to understand that the differentiation between the pure science and applied science is a long-standing question in our fields. On that same day, Cardi took the podium to address the Franklin Institute on the occasion of receiving his medal. And I'd just like to read a few words from what he said because I found them to be particularly appropriate for today. No one can tell how far away are the limits of the telephone art. I am certain that they are not to be found here upon the earth. For I firmly believe in the fulfillment of that prophetic aspiration expressed by Theodore Vail at a great gathering in Washington, that someday we will build up a world telephone system, making necessary to all peoples the use of a common language or a common understanding of languages, which will join all the people of the earth into one brotherhood. I find it appropriate that 90 years later, every student in America has access to the primary source materials associated with John Cardi's medal and with John Cardi's technological achievements by use of the internet, by use of what is ultimately the height of the telephone art that Cardi references. What I'd like to do now just for a moment is to show you a couple of pages from the online case file presentation so that you can see the flavor of the kinds of primary source materials that are accessible to teachers and students. Um, let me just pick Marie Curie as one example. Uh, in the Marie Curie case file, we find a collection of correspondence between the Institute and people who were advocating for the award to Marie Curie and at that time if you examine these letters carefully you'll see that it wasn't an easy position to take but yet we did have compelling support for Curie's re uh, receipt of the award. But one of the things I want to call your attention to is Laradium. This is a primary source material from the history of science, uh, Curie's document in which she published her findings about the extraction of polonium. <laughs> and there is absolutely no way that a teacher or student could have hands-on access to this document in the Franklin Institute's collections. But we've put it on, on the web in a way that encourages teachers to grab a hold of it and turn the pages to see what's inside this document. If you, uh, for science students at the high school level, at the undergrad or graduate level as well, the ability to see her, um, her mathematical formulas and her graphs and her scientific work is a tremendous opportunity to see it in the original as opposed to in a secondary source like a textbook. Uh, it is, you'll notice, in the original French, but what we can do for the um, for the text is to simply click and translate so that we get an English translation of the, uh, of the document. So this is the kind of access that the project we're presenting here today is providing to students and to K-12 teachers. It is our belief that the case files are a tremendous resource for teachers to develop their understanding first of what the nature of science is. I believe the fact that we're 10 years out from the National Science Standards call suggests that we shouldn't start with the kids on this one. This is a case where we need to help <coughs> teachers appreciate their understanding of what the nature of science is and what it means to be a scientist in the world today. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nathan Ensminger. As my colleague Ruth Cowan mentioned, I'm on the faculty of the History of Science Department. And as a historian of communications and information technologies, it gives me special pleasure to be involved with uh, this particular project. It, it gives me even greater pleasure, I realized this morning, to have gotten involved at exactly the right point, early enough 
to participate in the excitement and to bask in the reflected glory, uh, and yet late enough not to have done any of the really hard work that Karen and her team did. And, and I hope that you do spend some time with this site. It, it is a uh, remarkable accomplishment and is useful for both students and scholars. Uh, in fact, I spent the morning on the site. It is a living site, and so uh, it changes, expands, grows, and every time I've, I've stopped by, there's been something new for me to see. And in spending the morning with this site, I, I realized two things, or two things became really apparent to me that I'd, I, I would just like to highlight uh, for you today. The first is the importance of communications technologies to modern society. Uh, we talk about living in an information age. We are clearly surrounded by information and communications technologies. Um, all of you probably have cell phones. Some of you may be connected to the internet. If you're anything like my students, you may be talking on your phone and connected to the internet right now as I'm, I'm speaking to you. Um, but as we talk about the information age, I, I'm not sure that people understand the degree to which our lives are shaped by the technological infrastructure that surrounds us. And I think this is particularly true of communications technologies. They really are the foundation for our political system, our economy, uh, our personal relationships. We are a communicating species. And uh, we have been producing communications technologies from uh, as long as we have any records written records being a communications technologies, uh, technology themselves. And I think this is particularly true for Americans. Uh, Americans have always been self-conscious about developing technologies that would support their political, uh, their political vision. And uh, in the early American Republic, for example, the process of building a new nation was quite literally a process of building a new nation in terms of transportation infrastructure, communications, the, the kind of necessary tools for political governance. Benjamin Rush and James Madison, two of the founding fathers and signers of the Declaration of Independence, uh, believed among others that it was absolutely essential that we create not just a constitution, but a mechanism for circulating knowledge about the Constitution and about political action. And so for them, the establishment of the uh, United States in 1789 was not the end, it was the beginning. And they worked to create uh, tools to provide the people with the mechanisms for uh, participating in popular democracy. Now in Philadelphia, we're all very aware that the Continental Congress authorized the first national postal system in 1775 and appointed as its first postmaster general, uh, Mr. Benjamin Franklin. Um, but many of us forget the 1792 Postal Act that is perhaps one of the great legislative moments of the early republic. The, uh, the Postal Act created the modern postal infrastructure, and it was truly a technology with politics that it explicitly guaranteed not only the creation of the network that would distribute the mail, but ensured that it would have a particular character. So it subsidized newspaper and political communication. It was meant to encourage debate and even dissent. It barred the government from reading its newspaper, uh, reading its citizens' communications, but more actively created a culture in which Americans could participate. And in the years between 1788 and uh, 1920, the number of post offices in the United States grew from 100 to 4,500. By 1828, when the United States itself was still a relative backwater, it had uh, 7,800 post offices and had the largest postal system in the world. And I think Americans have always placed great emphasis on the ability of uh, its people to communicate across boundaries. And this was particularly important for a widely uh, dispersed geographically and, and otherwise population. The second thing I noticed, though, about 
about these case files is that despite the fact that we think of communications and information uh, in terms of the 20th century and we think of the information age as a recent phenomenon, most of the major developments occurred in the 19th century and most of the case files and the important players that we identify um, are 19th century figures. Uh, Bell Telephone, for example, which later became AT&T, was established in 1877. By 1899, uh, Marconi had created the first network of global telecommunications. In 1891, C. Francis Jenkins was making, uh, taking steps towards making visual information uh, communicable. You can kind of take an, a person's experience of seeing and hearing and transmit it somewhere else. And I think the great step here illustrates one of the ways in which science and technology fruitfully interact in the 19th century. This is not always the case, as, as Ruth Cowan pointed out. But uh, the great step in communications technologies, which I think defines our age as well as the past century, was the movement from physical communications to electronic communications. Uh, all previous forms of communication had required someone to move from one location to another. They could move very fast in the case of a well-established stagecoach network or the Pony Express or even an airplane but it still required physical movement. And in the 19th century, uh, scientists, inventors begin to abstract information, make it electronic and allow it to move at vastly greater speeds. This actually doesn't start as much as we'd like to claim it uh, in the United States. The first example of uh, telegraphy, uh, quite literally writing at a distance, the first forms of, of electromagnetic communication uh, were developed in France in, in the late uh, 18th century, the French developed a, a telegraph network. Now this wasn't a telegraph like we're familiar with, it was a series of towers with big semaphore panels that would flash signals. It was an optical telegraph uh, um, network and was reasonably effective. But what it does is it allows messages for the first time to be transmitted, at least theoretically, at the speed of light. Uh, in, in practice, it was considerably less so, but using this optical telegraph system the French government could transmit uh, a message 100 miles in under three minutes, which is really a quite remarkable change. Now, what did the French do with this? Well, they organized the military campaigns of Napoleon, and uh, just to show that the more things change, the more they stay the same, they also used it primarily uh, to transmit lottery numbers for the national, <laughs> the national lottery. And it was this optical telegraph network that the United States government looked to in 1837 when Congress, again, in a political act of technological development, sought to establish uh, a telegraph network in the United States. They were thinking in terms of optical telegraph. But recent developments in electromagnetic science allowed them to explore some new options. Uh, in 1819, the Danish scientist Hans Christian Orsted noticed that as he moved uh, um, um, an electrical current close to his compass that the needle would deflect. In 1825, an English scientist named William Sturgeon harnessed this seeming relationship between electricity and magnetism to create the first electromagnet. In 1831, the American scientist uh, Joseph Henry had created a working signaling system that used an electric signal to trigger an electromagnet to ring a bell. Uh, now, he was a scientist. He was more interested in the physical principles, but he recognized that it could be turned into a telegraph network for practical communications, although he decided um, not to pursue this uh, in commercial terms. Uh, the person who did pursue it, or one of the many per people who pursued it, was not a scientist at all, but an inventor. This was Samuel Morse. He was a Yale graduate. Uh, he was an itinerant salesman, and he was an aspiring portrait painter. And in order to fund his not terribly successful artistic career, 
he decides to work on the invention of a telegraph system. He wasn't much of a scientist. Uh, he wasn't much of an inventor. For that matter, he wasn't much of an artist. Uh, but he knew the right people to talk to. He went and visited Joseph Henry. Uh, and more importantly, he, he associated himself with a man named Alfred Vail, who was a NYU student and a mechanic, an inventor. And it was really Vail who created the, the Morse telegraph system as we know it. And it created in the United States a network of communication that expanded first along railroad lines in the post-Civil War period. By 1880, there were 32 million messages being transmitted across 290,000 miles of wire. By the middle of the uh, 19th century, we had transatlantic cable lines. We had uh, the beginnings of a global telecommunications network. It would be hard to identify a more significant change in, in humankind's ability to communicate than what's happening in the 19th century. Now, of course, and we have the telephone and the, uh, not just the inventive capability of Alexander Graham Bell, but the um, organizational abilities of Theodore Vail in creating AT&T. We get the emergence of radio, ultimately television, uh, and eventually tools like the internet. Uh, but this is the moment at which this happens, which br brings me to my, my last point that I want to make, which is really about the importance of these projects. Some of the figures that you uh, heard talked about today, you probably know. But many of them you do not. And your students probably do not. And yet, these are the figures that they should be studying, both to understand the shape of modern society and the information age, but also to understand the context of invention, how invention happens, how science works, um, who gets involved, how you participate. These are exciting stories. When Edison sues Jenkins or, or, or goes after the Franklin Institute, this is a remarkable story. And you can use it as an educator to tell stories about the United States, about science and technology, but also about uh, human <clears throat> beings more generally. Uh, this is accessible to scholars. I've started to use some of these documents in my own work. Um, this is a remarkable achievement, and in itself, is an example of the way communications technologies continue to evolve and to play an important role in our society. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to you. OK. The floor is open for questions or comments, sir. It does force us to come to terms with, well, what makes successful science or successful invention? I often ask, as, as Karen pointed out, my students to tell me what Edison invented. He didn't actually invent the electric light. He didn't actually invent the motion picture camera, as we've seen. He didn't actually invent the gramophone. He invented lots of things. But what made Edison successful was a package of things, including entrepreneurial uh, savvy, uh, a political will, uh, a flair for self-promotion, um, as well as technological organizational savvy. And I think that's an important lesson to learn about how science and technology really works, as opposed to the ways we sometimes imagine it to. Important lesson that uh, Bruno Latour has taught us about uh, scientists, engineering, and uh, engineers in society he has a concept of heterogeneous engineering, uh, which suggests that the thing that is successful, whether it's a scientific discovery, and there are failure, scientific discoveries that fail and others that succeed, or whether it's a business based on um, a technology, is a combination of many different elements. And uh, there are some people who are entrepreneurial in that way, that is, they can put all the elements together. And there are other people like Carver who just didn't want to. And there are other people who can't. So. But there are other comments. And yes, sir. You're right. There is a no university academic infrastructure for training engineers. Uh, it's just emerging in the United States at the beginning of the 19th century, but it's not well established. Um, 
there really is no such thing as the corporate research and development lab. And so how do engineers, and, or how do inventors rather, learn how to invent? Uh, it was partly through places like the Franklin Institute, which really served as a kind of clearinghouse for ideas. Uh, and, and prizes serve this function, but also journals, events, uh, the patent office, there were ways in which people formed communities of invention that are, you're right, are quite foreign to our contemporary understanding of, of how things uh, how things work. And I think that's also an important way in which, uh, there, the ways in which the past is like the present, but that's a way in which it's quite different and, and very useful for students to understand. Sir. For Elmer Sperry, there is both a successful case file and an unsuccessful case he, file. We have a process that if a case gets a certain ways into the prosecution and basically the uh, demarcation line is if it's given a number. Once it passes that point, um, it has to end up with a medal being given or by committee vote, it must be dismissed without prejudice. So the case files include files that were dismissed without prejudice. <laughs> but it is interesting to look at someone like Sperry who is a successful man has won an award from the Franklin and in later years is denied an award. So the, it, it, it's an interesting case study to look at how his invention of the searchlight pr is prosecuted but denied. I can't wait to use some of these materials in undergraduate teaching. I, I think they're going to be enormously helpful mm -hmm. to the goal that several of us who teach courses at Penn goals are that we're trying to achieve. Uh, just to offer a little bit, I didn't really have a chance to say anything about the process that my team has used in the, in the process of putting things online. Uh, in the Franklin Institute, we have a curatorial team and we have an educational technology team, and we've been working collaboratively on this special project for about a year now. And my team has literally handled thousands of pieces of paper in this year and loved every minute of it. It's fabulously exciting work. There is an element of surprise. There are some patterns we're detecting. Uh, the key pattern we've seen this year has been that the more famous the scientist, the l smaller the case file, which puts an interesting question into play. Do we want to select the big names who have less interesting files or the lesser names who have really interesting files. So that's an element that has really emerged through the work. The initial selection process was driven by themes. We decided that a chronological attempt would be suicidal uh, and not particularly efficient. Uh, so instead, we decided to take a thematic approach. Since 2006 is the tercentenary of Benjamin Franklin, we decide, and because the Franklin Awards ce celebration this week is also following these themes, we selected the history of energy and the history of communications. Then, looking at the catalog of the files that exist, we selected awards, not necessarily names, but awards that uh, aligned with those themes. And then we have an advisory committee of experts in the field who helped us make the final cut to select the case files that we would bring forward first. It's obviously not exhaustive. It's, uh, there are many, many, many more cases that would fit into these two themes, but it was a place to start. There's an element of surprise. When we open a file, we don't quite know what we'll find. We've begun to, su to suspect that the bigger the name, the smaller the file, but just what we're gonna find inside that file is, is a question mark. For example, when we pulled out Curie's file, we did not know that Laradium, her original publication, was in there. Uh, so that was a fabulous surprise. The, the process of creating the Turn the Pages interface for Laradium is a process that we're only applying to documents that, first of all, are multi-page, and second of all, seem to merit it because we obviously can't t do it for every single multi-page document in the 3800 case files, but the ones that are sort of exciting and ephemeral and, and, and add flavor 
to the presentation, um, we're, we're very excited to do that. We're also doing other things like for Marconi, um, there's a flash interface that looks at his, the documentation in the file tells us about his um, milestones in distance for the signal transmissions. So we've taken that documentation and converted it into a flash that illustrates the, uh, the distance records that he set. Likewise, for the Burroughs arithmometer, the inside, the mechanical operation of the arithmometer is both fascinating and hard to describe. So we've uh, created a flash-based inter flash interactive that allows you to see how Burroughs brilliantly solved the, uh, the, the issue of carrying numbers, I mean, the, the addition of, of columns of numbers. But in the coming year, um, next year, a year from now, we'll be reporting again on our work. And the themes for the upcoming year are the history of transportation and the nature of the cosmos. So we'll be looking at transportation technologies, including the Baldwin locomotive works here in Philadelphia, the Wright brothers, because the Franklin Institute has a long history of association with the Wright brothers, um, and other files to be named later, shortly. On that forward-looking note, I should probably uh, draw this symposium to a close, and I hope you'll also find a continuation of this fascinating conversation. And let me just thank uh, the audience for its participation, and once again say how much the University of Pennsylvania has been pleased to cooperate with the Franklin Institute uh, on this project and on this afternoon's program. Thank you.